In this lecture, we'll talk about making models less of a black box and more transparent. Let's speak about motivations for transparency research. One high-level motivation is that transparency tools should be able to provide clarity about a model's inner workings. So if we have better transparency tools, we can understand the insides of models better. Another motivation is that model changes can sometimes cause the model's internal representations to change substantially. So we'd like to know when this happens, when they're processing data differently, or when a model change has resulted in the internal representations being qualitatively distinct from before. Here's a juxtaposition of the internal representations of style GAN2 and style GAN3. If one takes the feature maps of both of these networks and takes, say, three of them, then they can be plotted as RGB images. So that's what we're looking at in this figure. According to the authors, when they consider the internal representations of style GAN2, they say that the details appear to be glued to the image coordinates instead of the surfaces of the depicted objects. Meanwhile, for style GAN3, they're more anti-aliased. The internal representations of these two models are fairly different. However, they have a similar downstream performance score. So sometimes performance scores can be fairly misleading as to the actual properties of the model. In the case of style GAN3, it has additional properties that style GAN2 does not. For example, its internal representations are more equivariant to translation and rotation. Consequently, tools that let us look at the internal representations of networks can bring to light important properties of them. Another high-level motivation is that transparency could make it easier for monitors to detect deception and other hazards that are revealed by looking at the model's internals. Let's now speak about saliency maps and their limitations. Saliency maps highlight portions of an input that try to explain what portions of the input are most salient for the output prediction. One possible saliency map is the gradient. In this case, we find the perturbation direction of fastest ascent to increase the class logit. So there's a class like corn, and we're going to find a perturbation that will increase the confidence in the class corn. Another saliency map is smooth grad. As we saw with the gradient saliency map, it looked somewhat noisy. Smooth grad is going to try to address that by aggregating saliency maps across lots of different inputs. It will take n different inputs. Each input is the original image perturbed by a different random Gaussian noise vector. So the ultimate saliency map is what's salient across all of those different noisy images. And as we can see, the resulting saliency map is a lot smoother and it looks a lot less noisy. Another popular saliency map is guided backprop. With guided backprop, we're computing the typical saliency map, but what we'll do is we'll make the negative activations and the negative gradients become zero. So we're going to rectify those. And when we perform the process in that way, the resulting saliency map looks quite different. I should say, guided backprop was not proposed to be a landmark saliency map. It was actually exhibited first in the appendix of a paper about building better neural network architectures. But the visualization in the appendix was very striking, and so it caught on. Evidently, researchers like looking at interesting-looking saliency maps. Indeed, there are many other saliency maps. Here are a few examples. Unfortunately, many saliency maps don't pass basic sanity checks. What we might want from a saliency map is for them to change if a model is being randomized. So if we randomize the layers of a neural network one by one, we could see that some saliency maps don't actually change that much, which suggests that they don't capture what the model has learned. For example, in the case of guided backprop, the original explanation is in the bottom left. As we randomize more and more layers in the neural network, we can see that the explanation doesn't change that much. Consequently, it didn't seem to capture what the model learned. Guided backpropagation is giving us an interesting looking saliency map but this means that sole visual inspection can be deceiving. The upshot is that many transparency tools 
do create fun to look at visualizations. They're very shareable online and people who create these tools are often invited to give many talks showing their interesting looking visualizations and claiming that they help explain and help us understand what's going on with neural networks. However, they often don't actually inform us much about how models are making their predictions. Just as another example, here's an explanation using attention maps and we might think, Wow, now we have an explanation for why the model thinks it's a Siberian Husky. It's using the information from that region in the image. However, that's a fairly similar explanation for why the model is assigning some probability to it saying that it's a flute. So it's easy to read into a lot of these different explanations and visualizations and impute meaning on them that isn't there. A saliency map that is more meaningful is as follows. This saliency map tries to optimize a mask that locates and blurs salient regions. So it's going to try and mask out the salient regions and drive down the confidence in the correct class. This does provide some evidence about what the model is relying on, but still, the saliency map is highly sensitive to the hyperparameters and how you do the optimization, how many iterations there is, exactly what optimizer you use, and it's also sensitive to the mask initialization. Saliency maps aren't just for images, they're also used for NLP and text models. Here are saliency maps that correspond to a model that predicts the sentiment of a movie review. So let's look at the last example. Handsome but unfulfilling suspense drama. It has a negative classification. It's a negative sentiment. However, the word handsome and suspense are positively associated with a positive movie review. However, the word unfulfilling is associated with a negative movie review. So the saliency map can tell us what tokens are salient for the classification and in which direction they push the model's prediction. There are many possible saliency scores for a token. One possibility is to use the magnitude of the gradient of the classifier's logit with respect to the token's embedding. So we're looking at the classifier logit that's affecting the probability and we're going to compute the gradient of that so how is that changing then we're going to compute the magnitude of that to get an overall sense of how it's changing and do that with respect to the token embedding remember the token although it's a discrete thing here it's embedded as a vector so we're perturbing that vector and seeing how that can affect the magnitude of the gradient of the of the logit which affects the prediction so there are many different saliency map scores, and while there isn't a canonical saliency map or one that's clearly best, these saliency maps can be used for identifying salient words. And this can become useful when trying to write adversarial examples to break a model. You could see what words are most influencing the model's decision and potentially modify them to make the model flip its prediction. Another class of transparency methods is feature visualization. With feature visualizations, we want to understand what an internal component detects. The idea for many feature visualizations is to synthesize an image through gradient descent that maximizes the component. Let's say the component is a neuron. Then what we can do is we can take some random noise, that's the input image, and we're trying to optimize an image to maximally activate that neuron. So the initial random noise isn't going to activate that neuron much, but there's a loss. The loss will be the neuron's activation amount. So through repeated rounds of gradient descent and optimizing that noise image, we end up transforming that noise image in into the image shown here. This lets us visualize what the neuron is responding to. A more informative component to visualize is a channel. Channel visualizations are like neuron visualizations. They're both arrived at through a gradient descent process. The loss is different though. The loss of a channel visualization might be something like say the sum of the squares of all the neurons in the channel. And that's what the optimizer is trying to optimize when creating the channel visualization. We can see that the channel visualization in this case has a lot of squares. Can you guess what the channel visualization is actually detecting? Well, we can look at real examples and see what maximally activates that channel looking at the set of all the examples and then we'll look at the subset that maximally activated that channel and those images look like they're windows 
This suggests that the channel was actually performing some type of window detection. Consequently, feature visualizations can give some inkling as to what the network is doing internally. I encourage you to look at the OpenAI microscope for many other non-cherry-picked examples of feature visualization. Gradient descent is not the only way to do feature visualization. One could alternatively use other methods for synthesizing images that maximally activate a component of a network. For example, if we use generative adversarial networks, we can have images be generated that produce strongly activating images. Here's what those feature visualizations look like. Feature visualization has some caveats. We can't always do channel visualization, which is generally more informative than neuron visualization, as you've seen. While convnets have channels, vision transformers don't. So for vision transformers, we have to visualize the neurons of a multilayer perceptron, or we have to visualize the self-attention layers. These are generally noisier and a lot less informative than if we had channel visualizations. In this sense, the models across time are sometimes getting more and more opaque, and our transparency tools are becoming somewhat less effective as the architectures evolve. Another caveat is that highly activating natural images often explain the neural network components better than feature visualizations. So let's imagine human users are given a pair of images. They're either given the maximally activating feature visualization and the minimally activating feature visualization, or they're given a maximally activating image and a minimally activating image. Then the user is to predict which image is most strongly activating. And when they're given the maximally activating image, then they're more likely to be able to tell what the neuron is actually doing compared to if they were using the feature visualizations. Consequently, some basic baselines may be better at explaining the internal functionality of neural networks than feature visualizations. It's possible to change the models themselves to make them more transparent. Proto-PNet changes the prediction pipeline to make the models more transparent. These models perform classifications based on the most important patches of training images. And these patches are prototypical of the class. If we were to ask a bird watcher to explain how they're recognizing a bird such as the one depicted here, they might point to some of its features. They might say, well, it has talons that look like that, it's got pointy tips, its wings look this particular way, and so that's why it's of this species. One can capture this process by making the network dissect the image into prototypical parts, such as wings and tips and talons. And then it can combine the evidence from those prototypes that I know how to interpret and use those prototypes to make a final classification. That's the basic idea behind Proto-PNet.